the chance in my former career as an Austrian diplomat to work with an Austrian foreign minister, uh, a convinced Christian Democrat who wanted Austria to join the European Union because he believed that this also represented his religious uh, ideals. And he was the Austrian foreign minister of the time, his name was Mock, and he received all sorts of letters from Austrian Catholics who asked him for advice when Austria was on the way of joining uh, the European Union. And there was a big group of people, very conservative Catholics, who wrote that basically this is a completely secular, anti-clerical organization. Why should we join the European Union? And there was another group of people who wrote to him pounds of letters, piles of letters, saying they were more from the ecologist end of the debate uh, in our country, and they were saying, well, this is a, 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 an organization that has no understanding for the values of creation. Uh, it's a capitalist organization. What has this to do with religious values? So the great enigma has always remained, what is the relationship between religious values and the values of European integration? Are they mutually reinforcing? Is there a conflict between these values? It's a question to, nobody, to which many of us have never found a definite answer and we're looking to the panel here today to provide this answer to us and with this I would very much ask our uh, the president of the historical society to introduce the panelists thank you thank you very much to the ambassador and thank you uh, Ms. vice rector for organizing this amazing debate and uh, I would like to present our honorable guest. So I would like to present uh, Noel Trenner, Bishop of uh, Down and uh, Corner, since 2008 residing in Belfast, uh, Roman Catholic Diocese in Northern Ireland. Uh, he's Vice President of uh, the Commissions of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Union, which uh, unites the Catholic uh, Bishops' Conferences of 28 member states of the European Union. Uh, he's president of the Conference of European Justice and Peace Commissions, and uh, he has published uh, and lectured widely on European connection issues, um, the church in Europe and the church in state matters, and also in his public statement he discerns the role of EU as a uh, peace actor and he's critical of Brexit and uh, its consequences. Right? Um, Following uh, is Mrs. Uh, Katrin Hatzinger, uh, Senior Church Counsel. Uh, she's lawyer by education, uh, Director of Brussels Office of Protestant Church in Germany also since 2008. Uh, the main in uh, areas of interest uh, regarding European affairs for the Protestant Church in Germany include EU legislation uh, concerning uh, German state church relations, political issues such as um, uh, conference of the future of Europe and dialogue between churches and the EU, uh, also asylum, migration, uh, data protection, social Europe, um, uh, ethical questions around artificial intelligence, uh, made in Europe, cohesion and youth policy. Uh, and also Ms. Uh, Hatzinger used to be the secretary of the working group of uh, EU legislation of the Conference of European Churches. As well, she's editor, and I'm very sorry for my German, it's very bad, ICD Europa Informationen, is it good? Okay, so it's this. <laughs> and uh, she's member of the ethic board uh, of the community of Protestant churches in Europe. Um, next speaker is Razim Effendi Cholic. I'm very sorry for pronunciation if it's bad. Uh, Director of Department of External Affairs and the Diaspora of Friesat of the Islamic Community and Bosnia Herzegovina. I hope you all received uh, also the message uh, last uh, evening in the email. Friesat is the highest uh, religious and administrative body of the Islamic Community. Uh, in a given country. Mr. Cholit uh, served as an ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina in Saudi Arabia uh, from 2005 till 2012. He's participant in different international meetings and conferences of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation as a member of the Bosnia uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina's delegation and he expressed belief the structure of Islamic community in Bosnia and Herzegovina can be inspiration for other European states. Uh, next our speaker is Professor Stanislaw Krajewski. Um, he's professor of philosophy at the University of Warsaw, mathematician, 
author, uh, leader of Jewish community in Poland, and Jewish co-chairman of Polish Council of Christians and Jewish since its establishment in 1989. He was involved in dissident activities during the communist period and belonged to a solidarity movement from its uh, beginning in 1980 till 1990, including underground uh, period as well. Also, he was former member of the International Auschwitz Council and of the Board of the Union of Jewish Religious Communities in Poland. And he was uh, the Polish consultant to the American Jewish Committee since uh, 1992 till 2009. Uh, last but not least, uh, Father Lech Nkindi, um, sorry if that's correct, yeah, uh, priest in the Ukrainian uh, Eastern Catholic Church. Uh, Vice Dean for International Relations of the Faculty of Philosophy and Theology at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. Um, also, Elena Boyko Chair and Patristic Theology specializing in early church history and Catholic social thought. Um, his interest in environmental topic, he underscores that, quote, uh, through a balanced understanding of environmental principles, Christians can be great defenders of the environment, not for merely political or material reasons, but in recognition of God's call for humans to be stewards of his creation. And um, uh, Mr. Zbigniew Nosowski will lead the debate. Um, so he will be a moderator. He's a sociologist, theologian, and journalist involved in ecumenical uh, and interreligious dialogue for many years. Editor in chief of the renowned uh, Catholic magazine called Vienge, which means in um, English bond since 2001. Um, spokesperson for Zranenie v Kostele, it means a hurt within church. Initiative helping victims of sexual abuse by clergy. Member of Faith and Light Movement. Member of Club of Catholic Intelligence in Warsaw. He served as uh, an auditor of Synod of Bishops in Vatican. He also worked for the Pontifical Council um, for the Laity uh, from 2002 till 2008. And he is Christian co-president of the Polish Council of Christians and Jews. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nusowski. Flores. Thank you for the introduction and, and for the invitation in the name of all the panelists. Um, believe me or not, but I, I've been uh, dealing with all these issues for, for more than 30 years and it, it's not very common that such a distinguished panel um, and, and very much differentiated, uh, but in a sense also, I hope, united, uh, meets and, and discuss about um, religious identity, religious communities and European integration. So my task is first to, uh, to give floor to the panelists. So the, the first part of the, of the panel will be uh, statements by, by the panelists, some, a few minutes, five, seven minutes each person. Um, and later on we'll discuss a bit among, among the panelists and then the floor will be open uh, to all the participants. So please think about uh, questions, uh, your comments, etc. I hope we'll have at least uh, half an hour for for a lively open um, exchange um, uh, at the end of um, uh, this panel. Uh, let's start from uh, questions uh, concerning well, a general attitude of, of a given um, religious group uh, or a Christian denomination uh, towards European integration process and also uh, how much uh, each of you, your panelists, uh, says what he or she says being a uh, believer of Christianity in its different versions, Islam or, or Judaism, uh, or in, in as much you represent what you think about, uh, about Europe as citizens of, of your nations, your states, uh, or Europeans in, in general. Uh, let's start from, with Bishop Noel Trenor, so this uh, Roman Catholic voice. Thank you. Would you like me to speak here at the podium or? I think maybe it might be better. I have a better yeah, view there. If you, if you if, yeah. however you feel better, yeah. I think priests feel better at the pulpit. I think so. Well, yeah. sometimes it's a question of sight <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, and vision. I hope. So, first of all, uh, good afternoon to you all, and may I firstly say that I'm delighted to come and join with you on this occasion here. Uh, if I'm speaking too quickly, please indicate that I should slow down because uh, we have, I have the ease of speaking in my mother tongue or at least in one of my two mother tongues this afternoon. So may I first of all thank you all for the invitation. I would like to say a word of thanks for the hospitality which I have experienced since I came here on the part of the authorities of the college, on the part of Jakob, and uh, I must say that I was at once surprised and delighted 
when I received this invitation from the College of Europe uh, as an institution and particularly from the College of Europe in Warsaw. I had never been to Natalin before, I had been to Poland quite often, but to see that the academic program here opens the perspective on the horizons of you, its participants, to the, to the uh, question of meaning of faith and the role of faith in contemporary society and contemporary politics was for me an injection of life and imagination, particularly given my own biography. And if I may very quickly, may I just tell you so that you can situate me that I grew up in the Republic of Ireland, one kilometre from the border with Northern Ireland. So my childhood was, if you like, spent in the shadow of two customs posts, one the, that of the Republic of Ireland and the other of the United Kingdom or of Northern Ireland. And each summer I looked forward to my father having to bond his car because it meant a trip into Northern Ireland for some distance with a citizen of that province, that state who, if you like, guaranteed his legitimacy and for which then he got his papers to pass the border. Anyway, time passed and as has been mentioned, I spent some 20 years of my life working uh, for the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Union in Brussels. Um, and then I returned in 2008 to Northern Ireland to work in this area or diocese called Dan and Connor. I live in Belfast. And that territory is totally and completely within the United Kingdom jurisdiction. So we are in Brexit land. Okay. Now, when I went to university, as many of you have done, which was at the end of the 1960s, 1969, that was the year in which the Troubles, which you will have heard of, began in Northern Ireland. They emerged from what was a civil rights movement, a protest against a structural discrimination in that society. You know the story of the Troubles. But in 1973, something else happened, just four years later. And that was the accession of the United Kingdom and of the Republic of Ireland to the European communities. In 1972, apropos the remark of Ambassador Meyer Harting in regard to these different bodies of opinion within Austria, one of my predecessors, of Bishop Philbin, gave a very historic talk in Dublin as then a bishop of the Catholic Church supporting the idea of Ireland entering the matrix of this new political project. Doing so on the basis of his Christian belief, yes, but also on the basis of his interpretation of the meaning, the import of Irish culture, civilization and identity, which he, he claimed, had been forged by all kinds of forces emerging from the European continent, of which this island in Finibus Mundi, at the very end of the world, was still a part. But he claimed that this accession would enable it to revitalize and reappropriate its energy, and that has been the case. This is my third introductory point. Accession 1973, curiously, this same European Union to which the United Kingdom and Ireland acceded became the space, the context, the schoolroom, and the laboratory in which representatives of both traditions in Northern Ireland began to work with each other to promote communist interest of their binary society almost, unionist and nationalist in Northern Ireland. It was the context in which Ireland, the once colonized island by the United Kingdom, suddenly discovered itself as an equal around the table of consensus building, which is that of the acquis communautaire, the method of the European communities and the European Union. That's my first point. Tell me how many minutes we have left. Second point, I spent um, about 20 years working for this commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Unit, of the European Union. Catherine Hatzinger, who was a cherished colleague in those years, will elaborate more on the actual work that we did, oftentimes together, oftentimes interreligiously, hmm, with the rabbi in, 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 in Brussels and indeed engaging in interreligious uh, inter dialogue. When I arrived in Brussels, which was before the fall of the walls, or the mid-80s, the churches there were there by dint of interest, by dint of a desire to support this project in which they saw the Catholic Church and other Christian churches, in which they saw the concretization in a radically new and unique political project 
of the fundamental values that are those of uh, the Christian tradition, of course fertilized by other philosophical traditions from Jerusalem and Athens. Okay. We were there, you might say, on the sideline. We were there like uh, one of the various er very early lobby groups promoting animals' rights. There was absolutely no reference in the primary law, that is to say in the treaties of the European communities, to faith, religion or churches. Understandably so. They were creating a market. They were creating three different kinds of communities about which you know a lot. However, it began to dawn on people after the ratification of the Single European Act that just as the infrastructure, if you like, for the market had been completed, and th those 30 years from 1957 to 87 roughly, the community, its own institutions, its officials and so forth worked on finishing off, if you like, and completing the infrastructure of this single market. At this point, time had passed and for all kinds of reasons, particularly some people like Jacques Delors began to ask the question, well, what about the purpose and the meaning? Le sens de la construction européenne, la question, la question du sens. Catherine will elaborate on this. It's interesting that the Catholic tradition, the Catholic Church and indeed other churches, after the, um, around the time of the intergovernmental conference that led to Maastricht and the ratification of Maastricht, realized that they needed to change their game because the process of political integration had begun and we needed to transpose ourselves from being mere observers to a large extent, journalists as it were almost, huh? reporting information, to becoming, to equipping ourselves to become credible and legitimate analytical contributors to the, to the elaboration of European policy. And hence you will notice in the history of uh, the Comissi office where Bishop Garetsky also served as uh, indeed member and vice president for a time, um, we began to create commissions and working groups of specialists, academics, practitioners, be it in the field of law already mentioned, be it in the field of social policy, be it in the field of migration and, ref and uh, asylum matters, be it in the field, for example, of interreligious dialogue, all of these seeking to identify connection points on the agenda of the institutions of the European Union. Hence, a constituent working method on our part was, at the end of each calendar year, and certainly at the beginning of each new legislature, to take the work program proposed as proposed by the European Commission and the institutions to enable ourselves to advocate the interest of all what I would say, European citizens, uh, and also to promote the, I would say, the role of the European Union worldwide as well as ad intra and ad extra. I'm getting a sign. I'm, much more will I'm come very up much curious questions. what you will say about Brexit, but it's, let's, let's come to it afterwards. Yeah. Right. Well, we will come back to Brexit in a moment. Um, but um, for three years until last week or the week before, uh, the political institutions in Northern Ireland were not working. They fell three years ago in January. That meant there was a vacuum. The first occasion that those elected representatives to the Assembly in Northern Ireland met in autumn of 20, where are we now, 2018, was in fact at the behest of the churches, the main churches, ecumenically, who invited these people, the, the, the elected representatives, to come along. And after that, they did, they met one another, and after that, the churches launched what one would describe as almost civic fora which took place in the course of last year where we met with, where politicians met with people from civil society, non-governmental organizations, universities, churches and so forth to assess and talk about the potential impact of Brexit. If you ask me, the impact of Brexit will clearly be evident on the economy. It will change the relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Perhaps its most insidious influence will be in what I would call the uh, political psychology of citizens. Because for 20 years since the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, we have been able to elect, to see functioning our political institutions, and to develop a form of yeah, consensus or pre-consensus pol politics, power sharing. Uh, and um, this Brexit has caused a hiatus. And should any, we hope, uh, that this will not happen. The intention, of course, is and the protocol foresees a border in the Irish Sea, as it were, very unacceptable for the Unionist 
or hard unionist tradition, the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, but any structures on the actual geographical border will unfortunately become targets for those who indulge in uh, non-political uh, methods, let's say. So I'll leave it at that and we come back to, uh, to questions then in the afternoon. Thank right. you very much, Bishop Turner. And to And we'll uh, move now radically to the south of Europe. And, and uh, I will ask uh, our g guest from Bosnia and Herzegovina to uh, take the floor. Uh, this is uh, not only a different religious perspective, a, a Muslim one, but, but also a perspective from a country which is not leaving the EU, but is, but is uh, willing to, to participate, to be, a, to be an active um, uh, partner in the EU. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I have a group of people uh, we meet usually on Fridays at the, the Juma prayer that we have. And uh, there is uh, one of them, um, university teacher, um, and we sometimes raise voices. Uh, and um, there is one particular teacher, when he would like to, to, to make us listen to him, he stands up like two of us stands up. And there is another critic, he says, you, Professor, every time you are lacking the argument, you stand up. So it's, uh, I was prepared to say I don't have arguments, m uh, many arguments, so I stand up to make my position more uh, at visible. So um, I would like to, um, I'm, uh, I'm coming from the Islamic, I'm not from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, yes, I am from Bosnia and Herzegovina, but I'm coming from the Islamic community in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is short for the Islamic community with the seat in Bosnia, with the headquarters in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Islamic community in Bosnia and Herzegovina covers Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, and Slovenia. So we are 50% already in European Union, in Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, the rest of us is uh, catching up. So um, <clears throat> I would like to, um, since in this part of the world, um, uh, we, we, you probably are not too much familiar with the uh, organization of one uh, Islamic community. I would like to present the Islamic community in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Although we had, as I informed our dear guests, whom I would like uh, also to uh, thank for the excellent hospitality. We are really, um, this is my first time in Poland and Warsaw, I feel at home. Uh, I would like to thank you for the hospitality. We had relations, uh, uh, Poland and today's Bosnia, or former Yugoslavia. Uh, there is, uh, on the north of uh, Poland, I know in the Gdansk region, there is a small Muslim community who, who used to come to Bosnia for the Muslim education. And it um, extended for quite some time. Um, people are still there who were educated during the Yugoslavia time, so we are connected in a way with the, with the Poland. Islamic community in Bosnia and Herzegovina is organized probably differently in a different way from any other Muslim group in the world. We are uh, quite uh, democratic and one might say that we are the most democratic organization in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, taking in account the uh, state, uh, parliament and everything. And I'm going to explain. Uh, we consist of small jamaats. It is the, uh, uh, what, is, what does it represent? A mosque and a neighborhood, which should be around 200 uh, households to form one jamaat. We do not build mosques over there unless people need them. So when the people need them, we build the mosque, they contribute, not, they, they finance it completely, and then we have the community. Um, on uh, municipality level, we could have 25, 30, 40 such communities, and then we have, again, um, organization on the municipal level, and then regional, and then uh, state levels. So we have um, uh, Mesheha in um, Serbia, in Slovenia, in Croatia, and in Bosnia, and all together they come up there. So what do we do? Every four years, we have elections in each of these mosques. Um, uh, out of clergy, five representatives of this uh, organization on a grassroots uh, level, they have five people. One is 
imam from clergy, the rest are ordinary people. Um, uh, citizens, um, I mean members of the Islamic community, doctors, uh, um, uh, engineers, or ordinary people who are working male and female. Um, and then such is uh, at the, at the uh, municipal level. Uh, again, the elections. Uh, appointees are going only this religious line. Religious line. Imam, main imam, mufti, and that's it. We have also grand mufti, but grand mufti is elected. We have elections, and the one that wins the election, he is a grand mufti. And he's got only two um, mandates, two, two mandates. Uh, and when it finishes, he m can be the best person in the world, but he cannot run for the third mandate. So two only, and that's it. Um, now, what we have, we have the, these assemblies on a, on, on, a, on a local level, municipal level, regional level, uh, state level, and the entire level of the Islamic community. They are also uh, elected members. We have um, our own parliament that passes the regulations of the Islamic community or the laws. What parliament decides, it is obligatory for everyone, Imam, Mufti, Grand Mufti, anyone. We have constitution that uh, the first we wrote with a little help of um, Austria-Hungarian Empire at that time. So uh, we amended it nine times. Um, as it is the, um, um, uh, the book that cannot be opposed. Um, you can have uh, um, your um, view on it, but this is something that cannot be opposed. A safeguard of it is constitutional court that we have. Um, so now the parliament, if, if they pass something, which we call Sabor, uh, if they pass something and Grand Mufti thinks it's not in accordance to the teaching, he sends it, he cannot, he can stop it uh, for a short while till the constitutional court um, uh, uh, goes through the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the question or uh, um, the problem. And then the rulings of the Constitutional Court never, ever have been questioned, nor is it possible to question. So this is the organization of the Islamic community. It's completely transparent. We are free from any political influence. State does not have to do anything with our, or states uh, do not have anything to do with our businesses. We have our education, we have our economy, we have our um, foreign affairs, I'm the, um, what, what, what state has a minister of foreign affairs, I'm the Islamic community foreign affairs um, doing, we have the, of course, the largest one, the most important, the, the religious affairs, uh, but we also have um, education and, um, and uh, we have our own schools, our own universities uh, uh, that we run with the help of state or sometimes uh, without any help of any state, but we do it. How are we financed? We uh, get our finance from the membership. Every member of the Islamic community on a mon monthly basis pays uh, the free. If he chooses to be, or she chooses to be the uh, uh, member of the, uh, of the Islamic community, they pay membership, monthly mem membership, and this is the money that we have, and it's enough. For the parliament that I said, there are still some rulings. Only one, up to one third could be clergy. Two thirds are the ordinary people in it. And they are deciding for the Islamic community the most important things. Um, um, uh, also, uh, women, uh, men are inside. And there is a, uh, once, uh, like two years ago, Mr. Dow, the president of EPP of Europe came to us and said, uh, we were talking about the madrasa, the Islamic school, Islamic gymnasium in Sarajevo, and he said, I, I recommend you to have, like, among the teachers, 50% women. I said, look, if we do that, uh, we will have the um, revolution here. He said, why? 
because we already have 75 uh, women there. If we decrease it to 50 percent, we will, you, you know, you, you don't have experience with Bosnian women, so it will be. Um, we are participating together with Catholic Church, with Orthodox Church, with Jewish community, with other minor um, groups uh, in Bosnia and in these four countries. Um, but we have inter-religious council in, uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. We are participating. Uh, Muslims in Bosnia, uh, this is Bosnian uh, uh, council. Muslims of Bosnia are majority in Bosnia and Herzegovina. But in this council, each vote is equal. The lowest number of Jews are there, but they vote equals to any Muslim or Catholic or, um, or um, Orthodox uh, vote. We are um, building ties because we used to be uh, very close Bosnians in, uh, and, and, uh, in this entire region, former Yugoslavia. We were very close. We were uh, living together. We don't have, we don't have, um, uh, we never had a Jewish um, quarter or Orthodox quarter um, or Muslim quarter. We were living together like next house could belong to somebody else. And when we have festivals during the Ramadan or um, some other people have their own festivals, we are all together. Sometimes we bring the food to the streets, sit together, all of the people, and then and helping. I just was uh, telling that I um, participated. We had um, a neighboring um, village, a uh, Catholic village, building the... Um, church. My father took me, uh, bought me a small hammer, and I was helping build a church, our church. And I'm Muslim. And the same was with the mosques, and uh, we, we, with the, uh, lived together. All. And that is this incident you wanted me to, uh, to, to mention. Last year, we celebrated 200 years of Sarajevo Purim. Uh, at that time, Bosnia and Herzegovina was under Ottoman Empire. Rulers came for this part of the world, from Anatolia, uh, Sultan would send somebody to uh, regulate the businesses uh, of the state, that part uh, of the world. And one incident is that um, because of some reasons, um, this ruler arrested uh, nine very wealthy Jews and a rabbi and asked them for uh, money to pay, otherwise they would be killed. So when Muslims in Sarajevo understood that the, um, the, these, their neighbors are in trouble, they gathered uh, before that um, building asking this uh, ruler to release their neighbors. They started shooting guns from the, um, uh, from, 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 the um, um, from the headquarters. So the Muslims went back together with their friends, Jews, took the guns and simply um, arrested the um, wali or the, uh, the, the somebody who is a ruler, wrote a letter to Sultan in Istanbul and said, we cannot have somebody taking care of state business if uh, they are against our neighbors. Uh, the gentleman was um, uh, released from his post. Um, uh, Jews were uh, spared, of course, and free. Um, and. Uh, um, this is uh, probably the only incident where the religious community stood up by force against their own um, rulers from the same religion to release somebody else. Uh, of course, Jews. Uh, yeah, they, they, it's not. I'm not, not uh, picturing the beautiful picture of Muslims. Jews helped also during the uh, uh, the last war. We had some incident, you know, that the, the Bosnians or Muslims had the, uh, the, the biggest problem with the Serbs who are Orthodox. But at the same time, on the level of people, you had people from Serbs helping Bosnians, Bosnians helping Serbs, Catholics helping uh, Muslims, Muslims helping Catholics. We had troubles, but we are uh, coming back where we used to be. And one, one, one more thing, I have been informed that Sarajevo is the only place where synagogues are not guarded by police or you don't have concrete over there. 
it's open from the street you get into synagogue just the same way you get into cathedral in Sarajevo which is an open space or in the mosque so um, we are still trying to uh, to pick things um, uh, Thank this you, Mr. is Chol Chol yes the, uh, we will uh, continue so this is the uh, sort of legacy and we have something to op offer to Europe especially now when Europe have um, uh, quite a number of Muslims, they do not know what to do with them. Um, France has one attitude. Um, I don't know if we ever had France from the uh, Al um, Algiers or Morocco when they occupied those lands. They have these people in France. I don't know if they have any representative, Muslim representative in European Parliament. British you have. Germans you have who are the latest one. I don't know if French have. If they do, I apologize, but they should have it hundred and something years ago. We can um, discuss the things the way we live. If they want it, they are free to. Uh, we, uh, we are ready to help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cholic, for, for sharing this uh, perspective. It's the same. It's a very important uh, moment that. that uh, uh, Bosniaks, uh, Muslims, uh, uh, or there are uh, undoubtedly a historic uh, Islamic community and undoubtedly European. That's, 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 a, that's a very important element. And now we will move to, to Germany and Protestant perspective. Uh, uh, and, and let me use a, a comparison used by, by Mr. Cholic before a while. Uh, he said that he helped with a small hammer to build a, a Catholic church, a Catholic church, and I remember that um, at the very beginning, European integration was called by some radical Protestants a Vatican plot. Uh, so, uh, and now, uh, Miss Hatzinger, you are you are um, using your Protestant hammer uh, to help building this this <laughs> Vatican thing. Please, please tell me about uh, how you understand this goal. Yeah. Also from my side, a big thanks. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me being here and uh, also being part of this uh, very interesting panel. Uh, so just to start with a few sentences about the Protestant Church in Germany, which is maybe not uh, in figures uh, a church you are familiar with. So we are basically EKD. Protestant Church in Germany stands for the Lutheran Reformed and United Churches in Germany. And we are basically representing roughly 20 million members uh, today, the Catholic Church, I think, has roughly 21 million uh, members in Germany. So uh, I structured my little five to seven minutes into three areas. So first of all, I would like to familiarize with our work in Brussels. Why do we have our own representation there since 1990? That's maybe interesting for you. Then I wanted to catch up uh, on the institutional and legal framework also of the dialogue between churches, religious communities and uh, the EU. And last but not least, also share with you some Protestant ideas uh, why we are such a pro-European church. So um, to start with, uh, my church was like uh, also Noel said, uh, maybe more an observer uh, when uh, the European community began to grow and uh, then it started sponsoring, let's say, ecumenical bodies which established themselves in Brussels, mainly made up by lay people, commission functionaries, uh, mainly who were Protestants uh, and, and wanted to uh, share also their uh, fervent um, support for the European project. But then uh, when the Single European Act came about, it became also pretty clear that uh, the EU uh, was evolving, European integration was progressing, and uh, it had also very much an impact of our status as a national church. So being a lawyer, just a small <laughs> excurse of those of you who don't know, but we have a very special relationship in Germany between state and church. So uh, in our constitutional law, it's even enshrined uh, that uh, the churches have their right of self-determination and they can really regulate their own affairs without any state interference. And um, at the time, uh, the Data Protection Directive uh, in the early 90s was sort of <laughs> debated. Uh, and, and then it became clear, hey, that might have an impact uh, on our state 
church uh, tax uh, on our state church relationship on our uh, church tax system. I don't go into details here, but this was the moment in time when it was decided a lawyer has to be sent to Brussels to monitor EU legislation and to interfere uh, when it should uh, sort of interfere with this autonomy of the church. And since then, the office has always been run by a lawyer. So this is a bit the very, <laughs> maybe a bit uh, unromantic uh, idea behind our existence in Brussels. Of course, over the years, with the EU also developing from a common market to a really a union of values, also our like uh, position luckily evolved uh, and also the office evolved a lot. Uh, when I joined the office as a young lawyer in 2003, we were five. Now uh, I'm running the office since 2008 and we are 10 and so also our tasks have evolved. Of course, the monitoring of EU legislation stays very important because with data protection, the regulation, you all remember that uh, there might be some collisions uh, between our uh, own interests uh, and the idea of European harmonization, but then of course we also do a lot of advocacy work because we feel that also together with our ecumenical partners in Brussels and Comissie is one of those, but also the Conference of European Churches and others like Caritas Europe uh, or the Jesuit Refugee Service, we want to also uh, raise the voice of those who don't really have a lobby in Brussels and that's for example why migration and asylum plays a huge role on our agenda, but also youth policy, for example. So we ha I have a very young staff member, only 25 years old, who's now very much engaged, for example, in giving young people a voice in the upcoming conference on the future of Europe. So this is, for example, also a point we're working on. Then we also feel we are a service office. So we have, since 2011, uh, our own little department on EU funding uh, because uh, many of our member churches in Germany and also our welfare organizations are really thinking European. They want to liaise, they want to set up projects with partners abroad. So we try to connect them, we try to advise them and we feel that this very practical work has also an effect on the perception of the EU project. So if you experience, if you travel, if you meet others, work on the same issues, as we, you see here in the college as well, this makes change something in your uh, attitude. And then, last but not least, we are also a bit uh, the Protestant embassy, Protestant German embassy in Brussels, so also doing a lot of public events, trying to connect also Protestant theologians with uh, EU officials. And as you asked uh, from about uh, from which sort of perspective are you following EU integration, of course, as a national uh, church organization, we firstly approach Germans uh, in the institutions, so we have a prayer breakfast, for example, set up for German parliamentarians, but then the ecumenical work is so pivotal also to our visibility and also to reaching out to the EU and also to all the challenges ahead. And this brings me to my second point, the legal and institutional framework we are operating in. Um, I uh, have to say I personally see it as a great ecumenical success that we have now uh, in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, that's Article 17, which has three paragraphs, which are uh, all very much important. And uh, paragraph three basically describes the dialogue between the churches, religious communities, and the European institutions. And it came already about uh, in the late 90s as a protocol annex to the Treaty of Amsterdam, but luckily was sort of also taken up uh, by uh, the sort of Council on the European Constitution and then uh, survived <laughs> the end of the Constitution like in the European treaties. And I think it's, it's a very strong commitment of the EU to dialogue with the churches, uh, seeing, acknowledging their identity and their speci special contribution as it's named uh, in this paragraph. But I also have to mention here, being a lawyer, that uh, paragraph one of that uh, article is also very important because it basically, as the ECJ lately has also confirmed, confirms the neutrality also of the EU towards state-church relationships, which are basically a national uh, thing, as you, some of you are know are from France, so you have a very different model, so we don't want the EU to touch upon that, though of course uh, doesn't mean that the churches and the religions when it comes to secondary law are completely uh, taken out of uh, the realm of EU law. 
And then uh, what is the institutional framework to, to guarantee that this dialogue is, is happening? Uh, I had the, I mean, I'm now in Brussels already for nearly 17 years and uh, I saw this dialogue evolving and I have to say uh, it's great now with the new commission that uh, the Greek Vice President of the European Commission, Mr. Skinas, uh, is in charge of the dialogue who has the portfolio of promoting the European way of life. So it's great <laughs> to be seen also as the European way of life. There's a coordinator in the European Commission to facilitate the dialogue. But then also the European Parliament really, uh, I think, did a big step forward in naming Vice President McGuinness from the EPP as uh, the dialogue coordinator for the European Parliament. And she is very ecumenically, very uh, embracing also the uh, like voices of the churches, but not only, of course, also non-confessional groups, and really made this dialogue in the parliament, which, which before was a bit one-sided, I have to say, opened it up a lot. So, um, and now let's see with the new commission what we will experience. Uh, it's, an, it's a time of change and, of course, also a time uh, for us to give our input for the future of the dialogue. My third point briefly is then about uh, like my church's outlook on European integration, I said it was maybe in the beginning may more, maybe a bit more passive, uh, then we also took a more active role, also really trying to involve not only theologians but also experts, as Noel said, um, lay people uh, into uh, following EU policies, into also making contributions. It was became very visible with the European elections last year. We organized several debates uh, also on the future of Europe in Eastern Germany mainly, using parishes as venues to come together, but also involving the local mayors and also MEPs, candidates. And uh, we, we felt uh, that this was really a strong sign, especially in that area where the alternative for Germany with this right uh, wing, really uh, rhetoric, very anti-EU, was present and our church, uh, or my church, sees itself really very much as a multiplier of the European idea because we feel that many of our principles are mirrored in Article 2 of the Treaty of the EU of the values. And we also feel that we can also maybe from our Protestant experience maybe share a lot of the challenges the EU is facing because the EU motto is unity and diversity and actually uh, Protestant um, ecumenical relationships between the Lutheran especially and the Reformed have not been so easy over centuries as you can imagine uh, and actually that motto of uh, it, as it's called in the church world reconciled diversity helped to create for example, the community of Protestant churches in Europe. So um, we, are, we sort of see also parallel structure and then uh, last but not least also feel that it's important to give uh, orientation uh, based on Christian values also to this EU, which is lately very much challenged internally, externally, bridging uh, gaps also, uh, trying to uh, avoid that tensions really lead to disintegration, talking about Brexit and really uh, trying to be also uh, a player which offers fora for exchange also via our ecumenical corporations and partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Katzinger. <laughs> now I'll invite uh, uh, my friend, Professor Stanislav Kraeski, to speak from a Jewish perspective. I, I have to admit that I'm not neutral at all uh, uh, in case of Professor Kraeski because we both are serving as, as co-chairman of the Polish Council of Christians and Jews. But I realized uh, that I think we've never discussed about European integration because <laughs> we took, we've, I think we've always took into account that it's a common, in a sense, Judeo-Christian enterprise. So I wonder what you, what you will say about uh, it. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I really feel somehow that it's such a good atmosphere and I try to find out what is so nice about the panel and the audience here. And I think that to explain that, you know, let me say what is the main problem with the European integration? Of course there are many problems, but I think one of the main problems is the lack of Europeans. That is the la there are very few people who really feel European for whom European identity is important or crucially important. And I think, you know, perhaps in this room there are many such people or, and that's perhaps the reason I, I feel so well. And uh, 
because, you know, I would say that the Jews have been among the first Europeans. Of course, it's all relative and there are all sorts of Jews, you know, I don't want to overdo it, but still, uh, the most, uh, about uh, the first and perhaps most intense Europeans among the Jews have been uh, present and we can see that. For example, you know, this transcontinental mobility was something that the Jews in many centuries ago were doing already, something that is now a common experience for most of us, for uh, many, almost all European, Europeans. And so in this sense, you know, there's this tradition. Now, but this is just an example of something more general. I would say that, that you know, modernity, Europe, you know, this European integration, the whole idea of Europe as it is now is a very modern idea. And this modernity is also something that is close to what I would call the Jewish experience. Um, there is this book by Sleskin, probably you, you, you know the book, The Jewish Century, written about 15 years ago, an American, but from Moscow, you know, who, who says that now everybody is Jewish. Why? Because, you know, now nearly everybody is urban, mobile, has to learn for many, many years, deal with abstractions, you know, it's not rooted and moves and the occupations change. Uh, or, of course, this is too extreme, the point, but I think there is something very deeply uh, uh, true in it. And I think this shows why Jewish experiences can be useful for all and for Europe. Uh, but to make it a more religious uh, a, uh, point, let me say that, of course, there are many modern Jewish approaches to the world which are not religious in any standard way. Still, I think even those you know, non-religious, secular, or even anti-religious Jewish ideologies would be r rather close to the statement by Abraham Joshua Heschel, a philosopher and theologian from Warsaw, American one coming from Warsaw, who said, let me quote, by being what we are, namely Jews, we mean more to mankind than by any particular service. Of course, he meant this in a very strongly religious sense. But I think this can be generalized a little bit. And yes. But still, I mean, yeah, and I mentioned the other, the other dimensions. Now, the living tradition of Judaism uh, has a potential that is very difficult to describe, although there is a word for it. The word is mess messianic, the messianic potential. And I think this potential has not evaporated after the establishment of the Christian church, nor after the emergence of the Hasidic movement in the 18th century, nor in the wake of the creation of the Zionist ideology and the success of the Zionist ideology. So this potential is somewhere there, and no way for us, no, there is no way to know and to tell how it can materialize in a new way. But I think that in this sense it can be, this existence of living Judaism can be uh, fruitful or can be hopeful. Uh, although of course it always, always carries with it problems and conflicts and tensions. But in order for such a Judaism to continue to, serve, to exist, uh, the traditional ways must be maintained, including, for example, circumcision or the right to circumcision, which is something that is now being uh, uh, contested and uh, reject, negated by, in various European countries. This is just an example. And I think this dimension I'm just uh, referring to is perhaps best or can be best appreciated by Christians, uh, although of course not only by Christians. And now let me uh, tell you one final point, namely that for centuries Jews were the only sizable minority, a visible sizable minority, the religious minority I mean of course, and the treatment of Jews was 
seen and still, many would say, it can be still seen as a litmus test of the state of the European societies. Uh, but because of that experience in being a minority, the, the current question would be, can this be helpful to help integrate Muslim minorities? Of course, I don't mean the, the Muslims like the Bosnian ones, which are the traditional European Muslims for generations. I mean the more fresh Muslim society, groups, communities, first, second, maybe third generation. Uh, how to live being a minority rather than a majority, because they all came, come or came from a major Muslim majority countries. So there are Muslim leaders who are open-minded uh, in this sense and they would like to learn. But there is a serious problem, of course, namely the, the majority, I guess, certainly a very, very substantial part of those Muslim communities in Europe are so deeply, strongly, and extremely anti-Israel that it really means being anti-Semitic. So it's very hard to use that experience of Jews for them or to learn from, the, from them. It is very, very hard for us Jews to offer the experience. Still, I think this is one of the most important challenges that we uh, face and that we should face. And if I may, just one more minute, the uh, question that was asked by the um, by Zbyszek, who was uh, leading the panel, uh, before we started was whether the Auschwitz um, uh, um, liberation uh, anniversary may means something in this respect. So let me just say one and tell you one anecdote that I heard from the director of the Auschwitz Museum. Uh, namely, one a few years ago he met a tourist visiting that place called Museum in the former camp. He was a Korean from South Korea, and he started talking, and, he, and it turned, turned out that this Korean guy had this five-year, sorry, five-day long, you know, free time from work, you know, that's how they work there, and, and he came to Europe, and he went to Auschwitz. So he asked him, okay, so we have five days in Europe. Why did you come to Auschwitz rather than to see only Paris and Rome or whatever? And he said, well, I came here because I wanted to understand Europe. Thank you. Thank you for what, uh, what a strong statement, uh, especially uh, the day after the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz and the, and the message that, that came uh, from there yesterday, I attended the ceremony at, at the former um, Auschwitz camp and uh, this phrase, do not be indifferent, was uh, a very important message from, from there to the world. And uh, let's not be indifferent also to, to the Ukraine. <laughs> and I'm very happy to, uh, to invite uh, 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 Father Oleg Kindi, uh, who comes from a very important uh, academic institution of, of the Greek Catholic, uh, so the, the Catholic Church of Eastern Rite in, in Lviv. And uh, I'm very happy that you are also a part of this panel because I, I think that Poland's task is to be a voice for, for Ukraine as well here in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, this is a great honor, and dear excellencies and eminences. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I will try to keep uh, to my text to be, you know, uh, obedient to the to the limits of the time. Um, but um, I greatly enjoyed the previous uh, presentations, and I've, I'm learning uh, a lot. And allow me to uh, present to you a Ukrainian perspective. I've, I was contemplating on these ideas as I was preparing these, um, and I put a few th um, theses that I would like to share with you. Um, Ukraine has historically been a multi-religious uh, country, Orthodox Church, Roman Catholic, and Eastern Catholic Churches. Historical Lutheranism 
and modern Protestant missionaries, large and important Jewish community, of course, Islam in the south of the Ukrainian lands and Crimean Peninsula. All these factors contribute to the diversity of religious um, life in Ukraine. Uh, Soviet, U Soviet U experience of radical anti-religious war, um, fight against religious religion, partly uh, succeeded in making a Ukraine religiously indifferent, despite the 80% of the population claiming its religious affiliation, only up to 4%, so let's be honest, are active church, synagogue, mosque goers today. Yet despite this imprint of, uh, of, of this reality, recent polls indicate that the church, no matter what denomination or religious community, still enjoys uh, the most of, of public trust in Ukrainian society. Up to 65% of people in Ukraine trust religious leaders, which is in drastic contrast to low percent of trust for government institutions, law enforcement, medical care, education, etc. combined. Also historically, a struggle for religious freedom was one of the most important elements of social unrest in the former Soviet Union. Wave after wave of religious persecutions only contributed to fostering opposition movement within the Soviet Union and brought religious leaders from various religious communities together in their struggle for religious freedom. And according to well-recorded testimonies of religious and political prisoners, such as um, well-known to you, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, or maybe less known, Cardinal Yosef Slipui, Boris Talantov, Ivan Voronayev, uh, Miroslav Baranovich, uh, my late great-grandfather, Father Vasil Kadrinsky, they all recall, uh, recall that, their, that in gulags, in their prisons, they rediscovered their brotherhood and sisterhood um, in God or brotherhood and sisterhood in humanity, um, despite the fact that they belong to different denominations or religions. In 80s and 90s in Ukraine, just like in Poland, in the context of Solidarność, it was the church leaders, or religious leaders, that began to unite people for the struggle for religious freedoms first, for freedom of consciousness and freedom of speech. In the Gorbachev era of perestroika and glasnost, their voices found new resonance within Ukrainian elites, also in Georgia, in Baltic countries, maybe even more so there, and in the hearts of millions of Ukrainians. And a very enthusiastic revival of religious life was and still is underway after the collapse of the Soviet Union. One of the most crucial points that I would like to make in today's discussion is the role of the re-establishment of um, this trans-border affiliation, especially for the Roman Catholic Church, for Eastern Catholic Church, with their ecclesi ecclesiological center in Rome. Right? When, uh, when you have open possibility to leave the Soviet Union, uh, this played an extremely important role. The same is true for Protestant churches and other religious communities as they reestablished unity with their counterparts in Europe and around the world. And then the influx of priests, pastors, religious missionaries from the West, seminaries filled with hundreds of vocations, reestablishment of monasteries, a Ukrainian Catholic University, which I'm proud to re represent here, and other religious institutions and communities contributed to the rise of interest in European integration, which did not mean simply an integration into European Union as a country, as a, as a political project, but rather into the sphere of the practices and values that are claimed to be most cherished in Europe. Protection of human dignity, rule of law, transparency in economic and political processes. This was especially acute in the growing oligarchization of the post-Soviet, post-communist elites and drastic impoverishment of most Ukrainian citizens. The Orange Revolution of 2004, which took place just three years after the visit to Ukraine of St. John Paul II, and the Revolution of Dignity that is also called the Euromaidan, had a clear religious face. Priests and pastors were the buffer between the special police forces on the one hand and the protesters on the other hand. The stage of the revolution of dignity was the stage for the ideas of the Christian social teaching, which are entering the, the public and political sphere. 
this revolution of dignity was also um, against the economic and political integration within the Russian Federation, which for many, and I personally believe rightly so, is synonymous with the return to the realities of the Soviet Union. We may agree, we may dis disagree, this is what we have the open session now uh, after my speech. Uh, suppression of religious life in Crimea today and in occupied territories of Donbas uh, only supports this thesis. Now, two last points. Not all religious communities are pro-European. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate, that has one of the largest number of parishes in Ukraine, has been a vehicle for the doctrine of what is called Ruski Mir, or Russian world. I must note that this is not true for every bishop and faithful of that church, but um, the leaders of that church uh, are expressing their um, um, loyalty to Moscow. And lastly, uh, for the most of the religious churches and communities in Ukraine, which, by, by the way, since 1996 have formed the Pan-Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations. This is a very important organization that has all the religious communities present, Muslim, Jewish, uh, different Christian uh, groups. The European integration is a very welcome prospect for the Ukrainian society. But this integration mustn't be conducted uncritically. And so this, country, this council jointly opposes many policies on marriages or gender uh, that come from the European institutions. Yet despite these important disagreements, the religious communities see the future of Ukraine in Europe. I would say this is uh, um, to a certain degree, a matter of su survival of Ukraine. This has always been, in the last 20 years, 30 years, a choice between East and West. And it's, uh, we've been trying to stay neutral, and we just see that it's not uh, possible to stay neutral. You have to make a choice. And um, if you choose between freedom and not freedom, then uh, we choose, or we want to choose freedom. Well, thank you. And uh, I do hope that uh, we will do we will have a very lively discussion now. Um, questions well, thank, you, thank you so much, Father uh, Kinde. <laughs> uh, when I was invited to, to be a moderator of this panel, I realized that the panelists were perfectly chosen and they have a lot to say. Uh, but I didn't know that they would be speaking so interestingly that I would not be as aggressive moderator as I had planned to be. Uh, so now I would have to skip my questions to the, to the panelists and ask uh, everybody uh, who listens so, so patiently uh, for this last hour to, to present uh, your opinions, your questions, your, your remarks, your comments. Uh, uh, we have professors, rectors, bishops, uh, uh, members of parliament, but we have students, first of all. So uh, students are welcome, uh, uh, first of all, uh, to, to present their opinions and questions. Yeah, you're welcome. There's a microphone, so please use it. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Anis from Alexandria. Uh, I'm very happy to be in the same room with different spiritual leaders from different religious denominations. So I will give a provocative question mm -hmm. that I have been asking for a long time, and I would like to have a short comment from the different panelists. Um, 28 years ago, President Delors spoke about the social and spiritual dimension of Europe. So he said, within 10 years, I remind you that was in 92, within 10 years, if you do not find the spiritual dimension and the meaning uh, of Europe, the game will be up. So, did we find the spiritual meaning or the game is up? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go first to the um, specialist from Brussels. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for the question. It's a very interesting one. Um, and it's quite true. I remember the context in which President Delors made this statement. Um, it's interesting that in, uh, where are we now, 20, 2020, I believe it was in the year 2016, some of the French uh, students may be able to correct this, the Permanent Council of the French Bishops Conference issued a text which is entitled, Dans un monde qui change, In a changing world, retrouver le sens de politique. So rediscovering the purpose, the meaning of politics in a profoundly changing world, in a changing context. 
And uh, it's a very powerful statement, actually, and it was hailed in this uh, Dans la République, uh, which is one, single, and like. It was hailed by the newspaper Le Monde as a particularly interesting and seminal document in regard to the kind of context in which we find uh, our political processes today in a world grappling with the fourth industrial revolution with such profound transformation of paradigms. Your question, well, what has happened since? I'll try and be very brief again. Number one, um, I remember the context in which uh, Jacques Delors issued this, uh, this, this challenge, you might say, not only to the churches, but indeed he did it in a context where he already had taken the step of engaging in interreligious multilateral dialogues. That was something which challenged the churches initially a little bit, let's be honest about it. He had run and conducted bilateral conversations with the Catholic Church, the Reformed tradition, with the Orthodox perhaps, with the Jewish community, with the Rabbi Gigi in, in Brussels and so forth, and with representatives of the Islamic world. At a certain point he said, look, it's time we gathered around the same table, remember. How, have, how has the European Union, because there are two partners in this, and how have the faith communities and churches responded to this? This has been a very dynamic and demanding kind of, you might say, mandate or invitation, whatever, whichever word you wish to use. Very succinctly, I will say the following. The fact that the Intergovernmental Conference, which negotiated the Treaty of Amsterdam, finally risked almost being pushed by Chancellor Kohl to annex a solemn declaration, number 11, to the Treaty of Amsterdam, that was resisted by many of our national member state governments at the time. Others will be able to recount the depths of the night negotiation that led to that, that, led to that annexation of that, uh, pro, of that solemn declaration. In the ECJ sometime afterwards, it was adduced as an element in a, the processing of a case. Secondly, in the Prodi Commission, I'm talking initially from the side of the EU uh, institutions, Mr. Prodi decided at a certain, a certain point in his mandate that he would seek to have elaborated a white paper on good governance in the European Union. And again, we ecumenically proposed that the desire of the churches to contribute to this unique and new, radically new pro project of member states beginning to decide to share sovereignty on the basis of agreed principles and laws was a novum in history and was anthropologically and societally, societally of such significance that those sort of forces which irrigate the humus of society which makes politics possible, that we would promote the idea of including a reference to the role of churches and faith communities in this white paper. I remember a friend of mine, a civil servant of the Union, very involved in this process, saying to me, and a fellow Christian, saying to me, what are you people at? You know, why this? Eventually, and we did uh, discuss these things with various eminent members of the Commission at the time, and a reference was included. Thirdly, and seminally, in the negotiations in the context of the Convention on the Future of Europe, chaired by Giscard d'Estaing, uh, there were fascinating debates about two things. Uh, first of all, a possible allusion to the religious heritage of Europe in a preamble, and the possibility of making a qualitative a new step to include an article in the primary law of the European Union to which Catherine has already referred, namely Article 17 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. So, I trace a very interesting and rather dramatic at times debate uh, between political representatives of all viewpoints and world visions uh, in this matter and representatives of churches and faith communities who made these proposals to have a, an institutional response to this invitation. The other side of the question is, how have the churches and faith communities responded on their part? It, now you might say concretely to the inclusion of this article. I have to reflect something of what you said, that there is a certain, um, well, polarity, bipolarity. There are voices which are very positive, but there are, in the context of our member states, indeed um, believers and uh, uh, churches which 
mm, are doubtful, which have serious questions. These can be legitimate, but some of them can be driven by ignorance or lack of what you referred to, Professor, to this kind of a the cultivation of what I would call a sense of um, a European demos, uh, a people, a European people. Huh? Uh, you know, people with a sense of being European citizens, I mean. Um, perhaps I should leave it at that and hand over to somebody else. So um, that's our first shot by way of answering your question. Um, the purpose, of course, of these, uh, it's a question we can come back to, of, these, of the presence of the churches in Europe, you might well ask, what is it? It is certainly not to defend or seek for privilege, though arrangements such as the self, the right to self um, determination in the Germanic constitutional tradition is very important in this part of German culture. But it's interesting to watch what Pope Francis has said in a number of discussions. And back in 2017, it was, the COMIC organized a conference on rethinking Europe. And it links very much with the van der Leyen idea of these kind of discussions and fora that we hope to organize throughout the member states on the future of Europe. And he, at the end of that, in his, in his address, talked about the responsibility of Christians and believers not to create spaces in them for themselves, but to create processes, processes of reflect, creative reflection, uh, to develop, you know, this and, and further this new project, this European project, on its, the basis of its values. You referred to Article 2 in the world of today, which is, of course, a world where there is much uncertainty, much anxiety, and that, of course, gives rise again to the pertinence, the existential pertinence of the question of the meaning and the purpose. I've said. Uh, thank you very much for this quick summary of the, of the process. Uh, uh, any other? Yeah, very quick, <laughs> because I think you, you asked a short question, and I'm not a spiritual leader, but uh, I'm just a church representative, but I would say uh, the law was asking for or looking for the soul a soul for Europe, and I think as I can just catch up here with, with Noel, it's a process. I don't, I, it's not a short answer, which is possible. We are still to think, reflect, uh, and still about to find it because uh, it's a variety of voices, and again, there is this need to find the unity and diversity and to keep it. That would be my answer. Any other comments on this? Okay. Um, well, the, the, in, in Europe, in um, discussing the essence of Europe, um, Muslims are not um, presented there. Um, even they, um, not, I'm not talking about the Muslims who are burdened now to the, for example, for, for, for the Europe who are coming from outside. You have indigenous uh, European Muslims who were ever there forever. Like Bosnian Muslims, we used to be Christians sometime before. Uh, heretics, yes, we always do these things. Um, uh, we had crusades from Pope because we were not good um, uh, Catholics. And then from the Eastern Church also, we were not good Cath um, Christians at all. And then it went uh, till the Ottoman Empire came and we turned Muslims. So. We were Europeans. When, uh, are we Europeans when we were Christians? And are we less Europeans now when we are Muslims? So whenever you talk about um, integrating everyone, um, and we had some uh, uh, announcements uh, or political um, uh, you know, um, statements that Europe is a Judeo-Christian part of the world. Uh, so what do we do? We don't know what to do. So we believe that Muslims, all those who are indigenous Europeans and those who came to Europe, if they are Europeans, they should be invited to a table to discuss European future because this is the, uh, we believe this is the way how to get Europe uh, nice for everyone. Thank you. perspectives again. Hello, uh, my name is Marietta. Uh, firstly, I would like to, th to thank you for your presentation, uh, for the speech, and for the participation in this panel. Uh, secondly, I have a question for Mr. Razim Cholic. 
as you can hear, maybe my itch is very hard, like strong. So I'm also a citizen of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And um, so uh, I think that today maybe we, we will see, are we sharing the same concern regarding Bosnia and Herzegovina? And my question is, um, what do you think, uh, to what extent are local costumes and traditions um, are being transformed uh, by growing, growing influence of uh, conservative Islamic uh, countries in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, here I'm not referring only to soft power of Turkey, I'm more referring to the Arab investi uh, investment in Bosnia and Herzegovina and therefore I will use this um, report for the Bosnian Foreign Investment Promotion Agency uh, which say that in 2017 Riyadh invested uh, 22 million uh, dollars in Bosnia and Herzegovina and um, so Saudi Arabia is behind some of the biggest uh, infrastructures project today and not mentioning that uh, in both of the biggest malls, uh, shopping centers, uh, they are both coming with the strict rules of not selling alcohol and uh, pork products. This is the first part. So to what extent do you think it's transforming the Bosnian identity, you as a Muslim also? And the second uh, point is more of, um, it's more on the efforts and measures that you are taking to reintegrate uh, illegal Salafi uh, communities in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is very important from the security perspective. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent question. Thank you. Um, um, I read the report. Um, I assure you that the, uh, on the list of foreign investors, our occupiers, Austrians, are the number one. <laughs> so they, are, they invest hundreds times more than Saudis. Saudis are maybe on the list uh, number 30 or something. Um, uh, th there is one um, which, uh, again, which is, I spoke uh, the other day with the um, uh, German ambassador and she told me the same thing. Look, I remember Elijah, Elijah is part of Sarajevo. I remember once when I was not ambassador here, I came, we did not have too much covered girls, ladies, and now they are there. Um, I said, look, we are not, we as the Islamic community, we are not promoting uh, this. We as Europeans believe that people are free to uh, do what they want if this is not against somebody else. Um, now, I also remember, and, and I usually go to Brussels, and there are, I assure you, much more covered girls in Brussels than in Sarajevo. I live in Sarajevo. Um, uh, uh, and there is this uh, type of Bosnian, you have, you have seen pictures, um, two girls, friends, one with the scarf, another is uh, with the mini skirt and they are walking together. This is again some sort of uh, Bosnian uh, type. Um, for, the, for the influence, I, I will take it as the influence from outside. This is something that we do not like and we as the Islamic community, we fight it. I did not have time to, to elaborate, but we are having uh, around Bosnia, everywhere, um, type of seminars for the, unfortunately, I have to tell you, I lost my baggage. Uh, I had some of these booklets that we prepared for parents, for students, uh, for uh, the teachers, and for parents and students if we, if we are not treating the schools. Uh, how to um, um, manage or how to avoid influences from outside. We think that we understand Islam the way we, we want it. A long time ago when we established these, remember our, our, our school that um, um, uh, Ghazi Husra Bey's Madrasa is uh, operating 483 years without stopping, which is high school. Um, and we are producing all sorts of um, uh, uh, people there, um, teachers, economists, and so on. Uh, so one of the great leaders said, 
we do not want outside influence in order to change us to look like as we were from the Gulf region. We need to have our institutions from Bosnia, led by Bosnians, which will serve Bosnians. And we are still on it. Yes, we did have um, uh, influences, especially during the war. We had influences from uh, um, Turkey, from Iran, and from um, Gulf region, not only Saudi Arabia. Um, we think that uh, uh, this is dangerous, first for Bosnians, and if you remember, what we, uh, we, we had some of the people who went to uh, ISIS fighting there, uh, the message was that they, when they return, first um, men who would they slaughter in the middle of Sarajevo would be Grand Mufti because he's not a good Muslim or he's not Muslim at all. Uh, because he opposes all these pure teachings of uh, what they think. Uh, so we do not think that we need any ideologies. Religion is fine. Every religion is fine. Every re religion, when it becomes ideology becomes dangerous. So um, I cannot but agree with you. We uh, are going, we as the Islamic community are uh, trying to reduce all these influences from the outside because we were doing and we will do in the future just fine as we are traditionally for six, seven hundred years. Thank you. Well, a very, a very important statement that every religion becomes ideology. Uh, the lady here and uh, two others. Perhaps uh, three questions, if possible. Uh, let's let's take them all together. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Esmet. I'm from Egypt. Uh, thanks for all your speeches. The, being in a room with the different religious diversity makes me feel very calm and and hopeful. Um, I wanted to ask you about the future of Europe because you're talking about that and there is this statement that says that the new religion in Europe is the no religion and that the percentage of atheism is raising because of the younger generation wanted to detach themselves from religion and the problems that were affiliated with religious conflicts in the past. So I wanted to ask you about how how is it you work with young people and younger generations and how do you invest in them and see them as an asset in a process of integration? And I have another question, but it's just for Professor Krajewski, if I can. Uh, you mentioned at the end of your speech about uh, using the experience of uh, Jewish so that we can make sure that the second and third generations of religious minorities here as Muslims does not have suffered from the same problems. I wanted, I would ap appreciate if you can elaborate more on which channels we can use this experience. Um, I heard you comment that although many Muslims are anti-Israel and that makes them anti-Semitic, which doesn't, for example, represent me as a Muslim who lives in Europe, been living here for six years. So, and I know it's not the case for many of the Muslims who live here because living here understanding what's a, a religion and what's a political uh, stand makes us understand what's Zionism and the difference between being a Jewish which is a holy religion that is mentioned in the holy book and Islam's, Islam appreciates it very much so and coming from Egypt where we know that Moses as a prophet were in Egypt and we appreciate that whole story about how the Jewish community was in Egypt and was living there. So your comment made me think, well, it might actually be that that you mentioned, but also there might be another perspective on how we could use the experience of Jews here in Europe to make sure that that doesn't happen, not only to Muslim as a religious minority, but also to other religious minorities in Europe. So I would really appreciate if you can give me more insights on that. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, um, hi, I want to thank all of our panelists for your uh, statement so far. Um, my question actually relates a little bit to uh, Esmat's um, first question. Um, and I'm sure this is a question that each of our panelists has been asked a hundred times before, but uh, given that two of you are resident in 
uh, I suppose, areas which, there's no exaggeration to say, has seen quite a lot of uh, religious-based violence in recent years. Um, we can say, I think, quite definitively that right now we have no active religious conflicts in Europe, but I'm sure there are those that would have said the exact same thing at the start of the last century. It turned out to be that we had such violence again. So my question is this, um, and it is addressed to nobody in particular. Um, I would like to know if we have seen the end of religious-based violence, shall we say, between religious communities in Europe, um, given, I suppose, that at least perhaps in, in Bosnia and, and certainly in Northern Ireland, as we have seen with the, uh, the failure of the Northern Ireland, Ireland, the North Irish Assembly to, um, to come to agreement in recent years, um, this piece can be based on quite uh, tentative uh, foundations. So that's my question. Have we seen the end of uh, religious-based violence in Europe, or is there, could we see a return to that in years to come? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe okay, question, yeah. Okay. Let's, let's do it all together. Mm -hmm. the questions. Thank you very much uh, for your speeches. They were very insightful. Uh, my question will be actually towards uh, Reverend Olekini. Dobry den. So I'm Ukrainian and Polish, and um, I have this both identity within me. And um, news uh, from Ukraine, they've been quite sad lately regarding religious, because I think the society has been quite divided religiously, and I think... Um, I think that might divide also the society within their perspective, either they want to be European or not. What do you think we should do that people, um, that people would actually be so united as, for example, um, you said from Bo Bosnia and Herzegovina they are. What do you think we should do? Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, so some questions have been addressed uh, personally to, to, to some of you, and others were very general. So, so there is a place for each uh, panelist to to comment and just my congratulations to Mrs. Rector and professors of this college because I have no need to ask my questions after the questions that are raised by the students. <laughs> okay. So concerning the um, anti-Semitism, anti-Israelitism, of course I know it's not the same and I understand there are many people who make the, the distinction but still uh, you know, if somebody comes from the Middle East uh, and has been taught that, for example, the, uh, the Jerusalem, Jerusalem temples didn't exist, it was just an invention of Zionists, something which in Europe, because of the Christian tradition, not just the Jewish tradition, uh, you know, everybody knows was the fact, uh, which is based on our traditions, that there were temples in Jerusalem. So, and, but, you know, it's a rather w widespread uh, opinion, so to say, in the various Middle Eastern countries that the, 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 those temples didn't exist. So, so this sort of attitude certainly translates into a uh, more than a, an attitude towards the state of Israel, but to Jews, Judaism, and Jews in general. Just for example, this is just an example. And, you know, when we speak about the state of Israel, and as you know, there are very harsh critics. Also, there are many criticisms, you know, uh, by Jews. But, but the fact that somehow for so many people and so many uh, institutions, uh, international institutions, somehow Israel becomes the worst country in the world, the country where, you know, the bad things happen much more, I mean, have to be pointed out and criticized much more than in any, any other corner of the world, it seems to be simply unfair and somehow, you know, tells a lot. Now, to be more specific about the other question and con connected to this one as well, uh, what is the problem with uh, the future or the presence of religious traditions in Europe now. I think that the churches or the religious communities, the traditional ones, are in crisis. Of course, there's a very strong crisis going on and the traditional ways of 
no, 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 domination of those institutions, churches or religious communities that have been, uh, you know, dominating in a certain place or in a certain area. Uh, this is not to be continued and it's very difficult to adapt to this to many of the institutions and their leaders. But I think the future will be very different and I think if I may that it will, the difference would be and I think it will be a good change, although it's to go this direction is very painful, namely that the, the main uh, centers of religious life would be smaller and uh, groups um, and p composed of people who want to participate and do it because this is their need or their decision rather than just the tradition, family tradition and the overwhelming um, uh, dominant uh, mood or way of behavior. And uh, so if this sort of religious life becomes more uh, widespread and becomes this more central in the religious life of Europe, it will mean a change and it will be, I think, if it develops, it can be a change for a better, deeper and more authentic religious life. And this is happening in various places. There are all sorts of groups in, you know, Christian and others and, and in, you know, also in the Jewish community and others who, you know, be, do, I mean, behave this way. So rather than just, you know, getting the religious tradition uh, from the family and accepting it, uh, this will be changing and it will be the, 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 the kernel, the most the important groups would be those who, who are perhaps small but authentic. And to adapt to this is a very painful process and, uh, and to come back to the um, Jewish uh, example or Jewish uh, you know, connection to the problems with Muslims, I think that the Muslim, the immigrant Muslim Europeans are mostly coming from countries where Muslim is the majority state dominant religion. To adapt Islam to the situation in which one is a minority is a difficult, painful and, you know, re re demanding process. And this is something that must occur, otherwise there will be very violent conflicts that would be destructive for Europe. And by the way, of course, in the state of Israel is the place where Jews are undergoing this painful process of learning how to be a majority. And this is also a, a difficult and demanding process. So, so I think that this is basically the point. Uh, and there was also another question, but I, I just forgot, but maybe that's, that's enough. So, uh, so authentic you know, life, religious life is something that we need, and this will lead to perhaps the, dimin ah, the diminishing of the potential for violence and evil that is very much present in each of our religious traditions. And, to, and the, the, there is no way to simply say that, okay, so now we want all to be nice and good, and so there will be no religious conflicts, there will be no religious-based conflicts, or perhaps violence. There is, this is not so simple, you know. There is potential for violence and conflicts, uh, very much so, and uh, in order to, 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 not, to not let it happen, we all have to be aware and have to be active. Mr. Katzinger? Thank you. Yeah, I would also like to come on your point also on the new religion is no religion and how to reach out to young people. At first, I want to challenge that a bit because uh, if you look at the world uh, around us, I guess over 80% of the world population is still affiliated uh, with the religious belief and uh, on a EU level uh, it's decreasing, that's true, but on the other hand, uh, I would also say that um, this challenges uh, coming, for example, in Germany also from the reunification where 40 years of communist regime in Eastern Germany also led, of course, to a very, very small Christian uh, community left. 
uh, also uh, leaves room for, for new, uh, new opportunities. Uh, some of our bishops are completely sharing uh, your view on it, saying, okay, it's not uh, quantity, but it's quality of the believers uh, that counts. But on the other hand, um, I still believe that it's also very important to keep up uh, this religious uh, literacy. And uh, it's true that our societies and many also institutions are becoming unfortunately religiously illiterate and, and my church is uh, also observing this and we really try to counteract in really reaching out to judges, to politicians basically, to diplomats, uh, informing them about our state church system with publications, event and so on because we feel uh, as one very famous uh, law professor and constitutional court member said, uh, Ernst Wolfgang Birkenförde, the democratic state also relies on prerequisites. It cannot create itself. And I think the religious communities, they can also create this sort of fundament a society is built on. So uh, let's really keep it up. But um, young people are key. And uh, my church uh, has also realized that it's not, it's a, it's a middle-aged church. Uh, when I'm coming to my synod, there are many gray-haired people there. So we really try to open it for young uh, delegates. We try to uh, use the issue of digitalization to also renew our communication. Of course, uh, we are slow, but uh, we are working on that uh, and also really try to learn from uh, the experience of Eastern Germany because, of course, there you have really some in some parishes really minority uh, or yeah, in, in communities, uh, Christian minority churches basically, and uh, they are very innovative. Uh, and so uh, we started really idea labs uh, really um, also uh, between East and West in reaching out by new ways, innovative ways to also non-believers or people who have become indifferent also, though they are still a member on paper. Thank you so much, Mr. Katzinger. Bishop Trenau? Um, yes, on these two, I will simply comment on two of these questions. Firstly, the, the future of religion and faith, if you will, and the second one about conflict. Um, I'll link on to what has been said and specifically to this remark quoted by Katrin Hatzinger from Professor Birkenfurter. I believe that modernity, which has been referred to already, a, a matrix of a phenomenon is such that the world we are now confronting as citizens huh, and that you will in one way or another in your respective professions in the future govern, whether you are working in the public service of a particular state or of the international organizations or whether you are the weaver of meaning as a journalist, the weaver of a public narrative. Artificial intelligence, biotechnology, um, the future of technological and the rapidity, the acceleration that characterizes modern culture and that we have been living already is raising questions of such a profound order that humanity, and we can see this in terms even of organizing our economic and financial systems, the question of meaning and the search for wisdom is the one that's confronting all of us. And in all our traditions represented here, there is a key distinction, interconnection made between knowledge, cerebral competence, and the wisdom that is generated by reflection. And therefore, my sense is, and I have some reason for saying this, on the grounds of my own experience. In Ireland, the Catholic tradition of Christianity and indeed the Anglican and Reformed traditions could be described with the German word Volkskirche. In other words, a kind of a popular inherited faith. And we belong to the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church because mummy and daddy and grandparents were of that tradition. We do not have, because we did not experience in any central way, the phenomenon of the Enlightenment at the end of the 18th century and the 19th century. We were spared that for all kinds of reasons. There were interrupters, hmm? uh, political and otherwise. Hence, the kind of debate between faith and reason in our country is still catching up on some of the dramas and the excitement of the 19th century. And for this reason, when I went to Belfast 10 years ago, I thought that I would try to initiate something along the lines of the uh, French Semaine Sociale, where people come together to debate, to, uh, to, to, to provide a space where there is a debate between faith and reason 
not simply about the understanding of our religious heritage, but about its pertinence for matters economic, political, cultural, artistic, literary, and what have you, in workshops. Somebody said to me, oh, you're crazy. That will never happen here. We don't have this kind of culture. And yet, every year so far, we've had an assistance of between five and 600 people on a Saturday from a limited area. That, to me, at least is a symptom, an indicator that there is a quest and an interest there. And I think that that quest, which is an existential quest for the purpose and the significance of human existence and how we govern a world that has become so interdependent, we need, we need to create the grammar, the literacy of encounter and of understanding, not just in matters technical and technological, but also in those kind, of, the, those kind of paradigms and categories which come from our cultural civilization and religious heritages, which are data, they are given of the human condition. If we ignore them, we do so ultimately at a price. And oftentimes that price emerges in the arena, alas, unfortunately, of the violent reaction. The second question about, uh, have we seen the end of religious conflict? Ooh, I certainly hope so. Um, but you know, I'll answer very briefly on this because time is going. I believe firmly on the basis of the Northern Ireland experience, which is a very limited one, I believe that one of the preconditions for that is that those who in one way or another have the privilege of leadership in whatever arena in life engage in precisely what this panel discussion in this session is attempting, namely discussion, intellectual exchange, listening and encounter between the different dimensions and disciplines of the human spirit of which one is the religious. Uh, had there been um, more uh, advanced applied ecumenical thinking and interaction in Northern Ireland in the 1950s, in the 1940s, when that state was founded, we might have avoided the violence that we sadly and tragically experienced. By the same token, I remember once organizing a session in Brussels, the churches in Northern Ireland, part of the solution or part of the problem. It's intriguing that it was, in fact, ministers and priests who came together during the Troubles and during the intense years of the Troubles in the 1970s, I'm referring to Alec Reid, you may know of some of these people, and Ken Newell, a Presbyterian minister, and others, who created spaces. They, they had a room in a monastery, and they entitled it 007. This was the number given to this room. But there they succeeded in bringing activists on both sides, hmm? unionist and nationalist together, clandestinely, of course, to enable them to meet each other, to get to know each other, and eventually to create the grounds upon which the negotiations that led to the Good Friday Agreement, etc., uh, made, made possible. So I hope we have seen the end of them, but religion, like all other, I would say, like all other defining dimensions of the humanum, is always capable of being manipulated, and it has been, alas, through history, and it's that manipulation that only dialogue Mutual encounter and listening, even indifference, will avoid. That's about as much as I can say. Now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Noel Trenor. And Sir Razin Cholic, your, your final comments. Thank you. Um, there are a few, two, two or three things that I would like to refer. Um, uh, Jewish question. Being a Muslim, I have to, um, I have to, uh, to, to say that um, Islam and Muslims, um, Islam uh, as a theology does not have anything against Jews, on the contrary. Um, now we come to the Muslims. How do they read it? Uh, throughout the history uh, in uh, what I know as the Muslim world, Jews were welcomed when they had troubles from Spain to other parts of the world. Uh, and they felt safe, more or less. Now, question comes to Israel uh, recently, to the Jews recently, when they established a state. And uh, now we, in Europe, when we are talking about Europe, anything 
should be allowed to be discussed, defined, redefined. Um, so the, the, the question of Israel as a state. Um, Israel as a state has its democratic, um, uh, democratic rule inside of Israel for the Israeli citizens. And when we say that the innocent 10 years boy is put to jail uh, with that state, it's anti-Semitism. I, 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 don't, I don't take it as it. Uh, I believe that any state that is unjust should be named as unjust. Uh, but for, for the people, we, at the same time, we have to bear in mind then that the Jews were uh, almost exterminated in our Europe just because they were Jews, not because they have stolen something or produced something nice or whatever. Uh, they have been um, almost exterminated. We have seen it. 75 years, we um, uh, remember 75 years of uh, Auschwitz. Um, and at the same time, we are having 25 years of Srebrenica this year. So 8,000 uh, people killed in three days just because they are such and such. These questions we need to uh, pose and answer in Europe. We have to have the answers. We, do not, we cannot have the answers without including everyone to, um, to, to um, uh, try to uh, hard as they can from their own side to, uh, to offer some sort of solution. I believe that Muslims should be included as well. It's not a nice situation. Now you have the, uh, in Germany, in other European countries, you have uh, ministries of culture or whatever taking care of uh, businesses, of churches. Only you have Ministry of Interior responsible for the Islam and Muslims. Why should it be so? Why, should ministry, why, why are the Muslims in Europe, in Europe that you are going to lead tomorrow, you are students here, and you will be very responsible people um, uh, tomorrow in, in the future of Europe. Why should uh, the Muslims be a security question for Europe if they are Europeans? Uh, they might uh, immigrate into Europe today or the day after tomorrow or they have, may have come uh, 10, 20, 100 years before, but they should be included in uh, trying to find a solution. The uh, future of um, religion, um, um, we in, in our part of the world, um, um, I, I don't see it as a big problem. I know about the Catholics and Muslims in Bosnia, they, they decrease a little bit, um, uh, but still if you go to Catholic churches and um, Muslim uh, mosques, you, you find people there. Um, probably because we are traditional and you, you, you get the tradition and religion in, your, in, in the, um, and the families. Families are still there. Um, so Europe should also take care of families. And for the, for, for the conflict, religious-based conflict, I, um, I don't think we will um, soon see the end to it. I don't believe that these conflicts that we have in our part of the world were um, religious-based. Religion was abused um, uh, for, the, for the political and some other uh, projects in this part of the world. Uh, but a religion you can, uh, you can ab abuse, use, and I think it is uh, we need to work with the religious communities and churches to strengthen them further, to um, to, to um, you know, uh, to oppose uh, these requirements sometimes from the political um, parties, figures, uh, from these political influences, because they use them in the critical moments when people are killing others. So um, unless we do it, I believe it's going to be. And something else, we have laws on uh, those who deny um, uh, Holocaust uh, and so on. We do not have laws in Bosnia. The, the people are walking the streets in Srebrenica and say nothing has happened. They are walking uh, next to the cemetery where you have 6,000 so far 
graves and they said no this is not uh, it, it didn't happen and there is something else we that we didn't talk about and uh, people do not know there are 50 at least 50,000 raped women who come every night with all, uh, with 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 the with the hell they are going through all the time and they are not allowed to go to the court in part of bosnia now if you go to the court and they make it uh, it's not um, you know they, they 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 play with the victims if they lose the case they have to pay for it so they go through it once again several times S uh, now if they kids know what their mother went through the first chance they will start start killing so i think we need to take the roots out and then to start healing the societies thank you okay. thank you uh, thank you for the opportunity to answer the question uh, i would like to answer uh, address some of the questions that were raised in three short stories first story 2014 annexation of crimea um, there is a ukrainian orthodox church of moscow Patriarchate. Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kievan Patriarchate, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kievan Patriarchate became illegal. And the community there was kicked out of the church. And the Muslim community came and said, you don't have a place to pray, please come to mosque. Mm -hmm. That's uh, one story that I would like to share. Uh, second uh, uh, story that I would like to share. Um, every year, for the last 10 years, um, there is a colleague of mine from Warsaw, from the center of uh, thought of John Paul II, myself and a colleague from Bratislava, we organize summer school in south of, uh, of Poland and we bring together Ukrainians, Slovaks, uh, Poles, and also the, there are just some Germans, Americans, uh, people from England who are participating in the summer school. And sometimes we ask a question, what does it mean to be not Christian? We, most of us uh, there are Christian. What does it mean to, to be Polish? What does it mean to be Ukrainian, Slovak? And one answer that really struck me uh, was uh, defined by Michal Luczewski, a sociologist here from, from Warsaw. He said, he quoted John Paul II, he said, Polish is to, is to be converted. And I, th I, th I thought that this is one of the most powerful definitions of who I am. And converted not to Polishness or to Christianity, it's to be converted to, to the realization that my value, the value of my life, the value of the life of my neighbor, of everyone, is equal. I, I think this is the kind of religion that most of the people are, uh, want to embrace. So we, we, we want to, well, uh, you know, young people don't, don't go to church for the ERQ with all respect to our bishops. And I'm also a priest, but uh, I became a priest only recently, so to say. I came to this conversion quite lately. But I think young people are actually looking for the meaning, for the wisdom, uh, not on the uh, vertical level, on, but on the horizontal level. And this ecumenism and sometimes our joint efforts to save planet from pollution, from the crisis of ecological crisis. This is where we, uh, we all come together. But I think that's what's most important is to realize the value of human life. And if European Union wants to survive, I think it, it mustn't uh, give up this, uh, this most crucial element of, I don't know, European religion, so to say. Um, we Ukrainians have felt that Europeans have betrayed this um, while seeing what's happening in, in the south of Europe, what's happening in Eastern Europe, uh, beyond the Polish border, so to say. Uh, but th that's another matter. But if, if we want to have a future and if we want to stop religious wars, I think conversion to realization of what is human life from the beginning to the very end, from the conception to, to, to death, uh, and protect it and to create structures that will provide that, that then we, we have a future. If we don't, if we fail to do this, uh, I think the wars and killing and, and so on and so forth will continue. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I think uh, I will remember this, this panel for, for a long time because 
Uh, we've raised so many important questions, but, but the more we go deeper, the more new questions emerge. I think that uh, the, this discussion is the good one when, when you are not, when, when, if you leave it uh, with not all questions answered. And uh, we have more and more questions because, um, as Bishop Trenner said in one of his statements, the world we live in goes through a deep transformation of paradigms. Uh, and we don't know yet what new paradigms will be like. Uh, so, so our most important duty is, is to, to make them at least peaceful ones. That's the minimum minimum to, uh, to, to take care of peace. Uh, so th this is my summary. Uh, but since, since Bishop Trenner said about this transformation of paradigms and he insisted on, on uh, having a right to say just two sentences. I will allow him, uh, not just because he is a bishop of my church, so it's not, a, it's not, any, it's an, it's not any Roman Catholic privilege. Just so, so f f uh, final words. Thank you. It was simply a, quest, or, or a request. And it, it's two comments. The first one, in terms of this question about the future of religious faith, Certainly we are all on the cusp of profound change and we cannot map the future. But one element I think that's frightfully important for all of us and which I'm very, very puzzled by is always the relationship between the charismatic and the institutional. In the world that we are facing, my friends, and the future that we're facing, the questions of meaning, of governance, of, are of such an existential order that we need institutions and we need institutional arrangements. It's intriguing that Pope Francis, who in many ways seems to be a guy who turns things upside down in several of his speeches, including those to the diplomatic community, emphasizes two things. The absolute importance of reappropriating and reappreciating our understanding of the significance of institutions for good governance. The second thing he touches on, and it's come up here this evening, is what he calls the globalization of indifference. And if we are to tackle this question, and if we are to irrigate the ground in which politics is made possible, I do think we have to recognize the spread of indifference and the key role that institutions, particularly international institutions, play, and churches and religious organizations which organize themselves and have an essential institutional dimension need to reactivate. Uh, that's basically what I wanted to say and uh, to recognize that fact that again in that address to the diplomatic community in January of this year, intriguingly, Francis, he emphasized the importance of these multilateral institutions and those of you who will work on those, I salute your, your aspirations and trust that you will make an immense contribution to our human future, the future of the human family. So sorry for asking for that, but I thought that was worth it. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's not be indifferent, especially let's not globalize indifference. Uh, thank you for the panelists. Thank you for the, to the organizers for uh, giving us this pleasure to, um, to discuss uh, here. Thank you to all who came here and uh, thank you to all who uh, watched live streaming of, the, uh, of this event.